Good day, everyone. Today, I am with the author of Cognitive Strategies for Suicide Preven Prevention, Addiction, and Anxiety by Dr. William Prietel. Dr. Prietel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a psychiatrist. I've been a psychiatrist for about 45 years or so. And uh, I've seen a lot of patients down through the years. And uh, for a while, I've gone, I went to do some meditation retreats and stuff, learned about mindfulness. So I'm kind of semi-retired, but I still work about 25 hours a week. Okay, that's perfect. So it's been a long time. Um, how did you come up with the idea of your, for your book, Cognitive Strategies for Suicide Prevention, Addiction, and Anxiety? Well, um, I went to some meditation retreats at IMS in Barrie, Massachusetts. They taught mindfulness there. And so I get to thinking that that'd be a good technique maybe for some patients and stuff. So I kind of, when I got back to working, I tried to adapt it to patients and seemed to have some success with it. Um, and then, it, you know, it could, you could use it for addiction or suicide and, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's where the name came from. <laughs> Can you tell us about your background and experience as a psychiatrist that led you to write this book? Well, I've worked at various state hospitals and, um, you know, I, I've, for a while, I was doing a lot of like Buddhist meditation and stuff and learning about mindfulness and, and stuff. And so I kind of adapted some of that to, to patient care and see how the patients like it, if it had any benefit for them. And that's that's kind of where it came from. So just a little bit different viewpoint from the standard viewpoint. What are some common maladaptive pathways of thinking that you have observed in your patients? Well, people get... Um, identify with various moods they have like depression or anxiety or suicidal feelings or addictive feelings and they get caught up in the melodrama and it really controls their life a lot they can't really stand back and watch what's going on and so when you use some of these techniques you learn how to become more of the observer mode and kind of get out of the melodrama of life and she was going on from an objective point of view, kind of step back inside yourself and kind of think, well, is that really what I want or not or whatever? You don't get caught up in it. And so then you can have more free will as to way your life goes. How do these maladaptive pathways contribute to symptoms like anxiety, depression, suicidal feelings, and addiction? Well, if you have if you have um, a bad outcome with something, you feel depressed. Your life's not going how you want it to go. You don't feel like your goals are going to be um, attained. Maybe somebody breaks up with you, a relationship. And so you have, maybe you have the idea that suicide is a way out. If I just commit suicide, I'll, I'll be out of my pain and suffering forever and ever. Get kind of caught up with that idea. Or you have the idea that um, you know drinking or using drugs is a way to numb out my feelings make me feel better. So, so that's an adaptive way for me to deal with this situation is to numb myself out. Or people have um, self-sabotage, um, want, want to become a martyr for whatever reason, you get caught up in that mel those melodramas. So these some of these techniques help people kind of stand aside and not get caught up in all that all that melodrama. Can you explain the concept of mindfulness and how it can be used to interrupt and replace maladaptive pathways of thinking? Well, mindfulness is is basically awareness. And you you can become aware of anything that you want to, like the chair, the table, the wall, whatever. But this type of mindfulness become aware of your feelings and desires as if they're objects. You don't spend time on why you feel like you feel, rather you you concentrate on the actual feelings themselves. And by doing this, paradoxically, you end up be getting some inner distance from them. Whereas if you concentrate on the, and the reasons why you feel like you feel the different stories, you get more caught up in the melodrama that controls you more. So actually this 
paradoxically it helps you get some inner distance from what's going on in your life to bring you down. What sets your approach to mindfulness apart from other techniques such as mindfulness taught in DBT? Well, that type of mind, there's different things you can focus your mind on. You can focus your mind on uh, your physical body. You can focus your mind on external situations. Um, like you can focus your mind on breathing, that kind of stuff. And so DBT mindfulness focuses much more on the body, sensations in the body, the breath and stuff like this, where the type of mindfulness I teach focuses much more on what you call mind objects such as emotions, desires, that type of thing. That's the big difference. How have you seen mindfulness work in improving mental health outcomes for your patients? I've I've seen it I've seen it work when nothing else works. I've, I've had some patients I've had patients come and they tried different types of psychotherapy and and so on and nothing they all ready to give up. You know, feel suicidal or whatever. Nothing actually absolutely nothing works and then Teach them mindfulness, and mindfulness actually works. It's like a light going off. It helps, helps them cope with it. But actually, I want to mention here also that um, I'm not really touting the book that much as a self-help book. I know that people may want to use it for that, but people can get, be very immersed in in a, a lot of severe mental health issues and right. addictions and stuff. And so just to think you can read a self-help book and get some benefit out of it and get yourself out of all of that morass is not necessarily the truth. And I've, in fact, I've had, I've taught people some degree of mindfulness to give them a handouts on it. And I've had, have had some bad outcomes like people committing suicide and, you know, drinking and using drugs and dying from that and stuff. So, I mean, I, I totally don't want to take responsibility for somebody doing that, thinking this is a self-help book. It's going to rescue rescue them from all that. These are just techniques that a person, if if they like the techniques, they can they can talk to their therapist about them, their doctor about them, but not necessarily think they're going to get over a severe mental illness by themselves just with using these techniques. Thank you, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, could you share some of the techniques you discuss in the book that can be used to establish and reinforce adaptive pathways of thinking? Well, basically. Um, you look at your patterns of thinking, um, say you, you're thinking negative about something that was, um, you think, oh, I can't do it, or you focus on the bad outcomes you've had in the past and become discouraged. And so by using cognitive skills, you can switch all that, learn how to think positive and not focus on the negative side of things, but really focus on the positive side of things. Is there a difference between seeing the glass as half empty, half full? It looks on the half full part and thinking in a more positive mode about um, the situation. And also, um, when, when, you, when you have some bad situations, say you have a relationship breakup, you, sometimes you need to learn how to just accept it and tell yourself you need to accept it, that you this is over with. You need to get out of your life, that kind of stuff. Give yourself good advice in regards to that, as opposed to keeping on have, having the idea where you get back together again or something along that line. In your book, you mentioned the influence of, of invisible spiritual worlds on our thinking. Can you elaborate on this thing concept and how it relates to cognitive strategies for mental health? That's pretty a deep topic. Um, as a matter of fact, in psychology and psychiatry, both of them are like atheistic. They don't believe in any of that kind of stuff. But if you read the Bible and and different spiritual texts, thousands of years ago, there was a, there was like a war in heaven, and one of the, the one of the main archangels, Lucifer, rebelled against God and was thrown out of heaven. He took one third of the angels with him. And they came down to earth. And Lucifer, who became Satan, decided to engage in war against God. Now, Satan cannot harm God, but Satan can certainly try to harm his creation, which is mankind. Right. And so, and so these he 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 has many fallen angels who came with him. And according to spiritual warfare, what they do 
is they project thoughts and, and feelings into people into their mind, like, oh, you're no good for nothing, you, but you, you should kill yourself um, or kill somebody else or any number of bad stuff like that. And people hear that in their, in their own minds and they repeat it a few times and become stronger and stronger. They think that's their thoughts. And so they act on them and get a bad outcome. And so there's kind of like rules of the game here. There's not really a game, the rules of the contest. Like Satan just can't pull your, he's not really allowed to take your soul out of your body and take it down to hell. But what he can do is to get you to act in such ways so that after you die, that um, he can claim your soul. And when he claims your soul, you, you drag, your, your soul is dragged down to, head, down to hell and then is tortured by, by Satan and his uh, fallen angels, by demons. And, if, and you can go on to a YouTube video and, and see a lot of videos of people who have died and suicide by suicide or drug overdose, they went to hell. They experienced horrific conditions and they were all, pretty much all saved by Jesus Christ with the provision that they come back and tell their tell. You go on a YouTube video and watch some of these videos. It's really, it's really uh, mind-boggling. And so you kind of get on the on the lookout for this kind of stuff happening in your own life. And there are certain tools that you can use um, that can help you. Uh, one is, for example, one is the blood and one is the name. So you can use um, the blood of Jesus. You know, may the blood of may the blood of Jesus be on me, or the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. I've had people like hear voices and stuff in their head, like voice telling them to kill themselves or kill other people. I said, well, why don't you use some spiritual techniques here? The medications weren't working. Try the spiritual techniques. When you hear that in your head, just say, when the blood of Jesus be on me, or may the may the blood of Jesus be on you, or whatever. And so when they do that, the voices like go away. And they no longer feel suicidal or homicidal. But I've also had, but it's also had like the opposite reaction. I've had, um, for example, what this one woman, she, um, I, I, I tried to talk to her about spiritual warfare and she turned me into the administration of the hospital. She said, this doctor is bogus, like this doctor is bogus. He believes in demons. I want somebody who's more scientific. And after a while I got fired from that hospital. Another another uh, one is that um, this this woman I know she was an alcoholic had worked for her off and on for years and she burned out her liver and um, she came came in the hospital and she had a side yeast all swollen up with fluid and yellow skin and stuff like this and I told her I said well. Um, I know a little bit about medicine. I don't think you can be around that much longer. I think you're gonna die pretty soon. And so what you may wanna do is to get um, bapt baptized or something like this, take the Lord to be your, your, your savior and all that. And she got really angry at me and said, oh, you're trying to teach me, trying to, trying to convert me into Buddhism, which is not the, I didn't mention Buddhism. And she turned me into the, um, my boss and that kind of stuff trying to get me fired from there. She died about two weeks later or two or three weeks later. And so people can have, people, not, not, a lot of people are not really receptive to this whole idea of spiritual warfare because it, because of both psychology and psychiatry, it's, it's almost completely atheistic. They don't believe in any of this kind of stuff whatsoever. So uh, <laughs> you have to be a little careful. And I had another guy, another, another patient, I said, well, um, it, it, you know, I can't I can't prevent you from committing suicide, but before you do it, you should at least wise go on the YouTube video and watch some of those videos, put on in your search engine, put on YouTube plus hell plus suicide or whatever, and pull up some of those videos because people had near death experiences and they this is what they experienced. And like very few of them are saved by Jesus Christ or Archangel or somebody or, or God the Father, and, and they were kind of like told to tell their tell. So he turned me in too to the authorities of the hospital, trying to get me fired. And so, like I said, eventually I got fired. Um, 
So people, some people were just not into this at all, and they had a violent reaction to it. And so, and they say, well, like, kind of like their attitude is, why are you teaching me talking about this when that's really the, the priest should be doing this or the pastor? But the reality is the, the pastor, the priest, or the priest doesn't talk about this. And so as a psychiatrist, if this is what's really going on, if there's then, then by just using standard methods, you're completely missing the boat here. And at least wise, you know, try, I've, I've seen some really good outcomes with uh, spiritual warfare techniques. Personally, I do that too. Whenever I feel scared, I would just say in Jesus name and all those feelings will just go away. It's really useful. Yeah, it seems to anesthetize the feelings temporarily, but you have to keep on doing it over and over again and change your, change your thinking and kind of develop a protective shield around yourself and not, not be involved in activities that will um, give the demons legality over your life. You know, don't get involved with the occult. Don't get involved using drugs. Don't be, get involved going to bars and drinking and all that kind of stuff because you're just giving them legality to invade your mind and your life all the more. But of course, none of this is taught in psychiatry or, psych or psych psychology at all. Right, yeah. Zero, we're talking like zero. And if you do mention it, then you're you're almost like outcast or whatever. How does your book address the issue of the spiritual forces seeking to influence our thoughts and actions? Well, just kind of like as I mentioned, you know, you, you learn, you learn, you figure this is, what one view of this is a spiritual warfare and, 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 and I have to, you, you learn not to do everything by yourself. You learn to depend on God and we're not supposed to do everything by ourselves. And we, we try to bring in positive forces divine forces into our life by calling out to them, you know, praying and, you know, may the blood of Jesus be on me and that kind of stuff, or may the blood of Jesus be on you, or in the name of Jesus Christ, um, I, I rebuke you or something like that. So call in positive forces, which of course, none of this is taught in psychology or psychiatry. Can you explain the brief discussion of energy medicine in your book and its relevance to cognitive strategies for mental health? Well, in the yoga, they talk, they talk about the inner, different energy centers. And one of, one, of the, um, one of the goals in spiritual evolution is to uh, purify our different, our different uh, chakras or spiritual centers. And might, you do this by working with energy itself or working with your thought thinking and Try try to uh, basically purify yourself with the different energy centers, and by by doing this, become more and more uh, resistant to uh, neg negative forces and stuff. What do you hope readers will take away from your book, and how it can help them in their own journeys towards mental well being? Well, there's a whole bunch of different techniques in the book, and so. Um, like I say, I'm not really recommending self-treatment, especially if you have severe mental illness. Right. And stuff. I've, seen, I've seen too many bad outcomes occur. People get over their head real quick. Mm -hmm. But for, but eventually, if you if you work with a therapist or work with a doctor and you see some techniques in there that you think might be useful, then you make them part of yourself, make, make them part of your thinking. So it happens more and more automatically. And then lo and behold, you start to find your symptoms are going into remission. You gain more and more inner freedom. There's no, there's no true uh, freedom without inner freedom. You might think that you're free, but if you're, but, but if you're haunted by addiction and cravings and emotional reactions, you're not really free. You have to learn, gain inner freedom, get out of freedom. This has been a good discussion so far. I'm a psychology student as well, second year in college. Um, so for people who is who's like me. Um, where can we purchase your book if this is something that interests us? Well, you, you can purchase them off Amazon.com. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure speaking with you. Okay, you too. Thank you. Bye. Offers Plus.